be a general wave and you don't even have to be thinking about anybody in particular. But it is always good to think, hey, this one's for Lucas. And then that, yeah, see that looks pretty good. <laughs> Welcome to worship. We'll pray at the close of this song.
Psalm 23 provide an anchor, even as uh, I think it's Ryan Stevenson gives us this great song to give us hope when things are tough. Around our nation, well, there's some really tough things happening. We've heard about Seattle, riots in Georgia, someone was shot, and another rioting down there. Uh, it's flight day. We're going to celebrate something special at the end of the service, but that's later. And so we're just going to come with all this stuff going on. And then the growing season being what it is, let's thank our Father that we can worship. Heavenly Father, we look around. Uh, if we didn't have these other reports, we'd say, wow, this is just a beautiful life. But we know life consists more than just what we experience when it's good. We live in a world that's broken, it's hurting. People are broken. People are lost. People do and are encouraged to do wrong. Right now there's an emboldening spirit blowing through the land. And our Father, we turn to you and we say we're going to trust you. We're not going to let go of your promise to be with us. So thank you, Father. And we pray for our brothers and sisters who are in places where there is anger and even uh, revolt and revolution. Oh, Lord Jesus, protect our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, bring to the minds and hearts of those who would hurt others and destroy truth of your presence and your power and your perfect love. This is our prayer today. We pray it in Jesus' strong and holy name. Amen and amen. Well, we have been having some uh, good search team meetings and Doug is coming to come up and give us an update and some more information. And after that, uh, Bill's going to join him. Two of our deacons here today, we're going to pray. So, come on, Doug. Mother.
Thursday night, Thursday afternoon, late afternoon, we had a, another Zoom meeting with Paul Benton. And I don't know, it's went somewhere it's between two hours and a half hour, two and a half hours and two hours, 45 minutes, I think it was. And he informed us that the long one is yet to come. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. But it's a process. We're moving forward. And uh, thank you for your prayers. We need them. Uh, as we move forward. Part of the process of moving forward and for him to be able to discern who the right candidate, who the right pastor will be for our church, our congregation, our community. The only way you find that out is, is to get where people's lives are at. And it gets to be a hard thing to do. We as a search team, we kind of got an idea. We got our, we know where somewhat our own lives are, our opinions, what we want, what we like, what we don't like. But we don't know what you like or don't like or want or need and where your life is. And in order to find that out, I know there's all kinds of you that just detest this word survey. <laughs> but there's a survey that he has for us. And we're not going to run you in a room and force you to do it. But this week we're going to be making out a paper uh, that's going to have a information on it. It's preferably to do it online. You do not sign your name on it. You don't have to. The results are compiled together. They're not used individually. We can get a paper copy for you if you would like. But anyway, on this sheet of paper that's going to be in your boxes next week, there will be one put in there per family. But we would like as many as possible to do it individually, and I don't know, as you feel comfortable, that we're going to set an age on it, maybe in this 15, 16-year-old and up, uh, because those people are coming up also in our church. I guess if somebody a little younger than that feels comfortable, fine. But we're going to ask that you avail yourself of that. This is the hard copy. Uh, there's some personal questions in there, which obviously we're not going to know individually, but we'll know collectively that it's going to help bring the right person here. So I'm going to highly encourage you to do that. I'm sure it's going to take a half hour, 45 minutes of your time. But uh, it'll be very helpful. And so next week you look at your mailbox, that letter will be in there with the link to get on and what you gotta do to get on online to do it. And if you would prefer a hard copy, we can accommodate that. You ask for one, we'll get you one. And we'd like to be able to have that results or have them done by the following Sunday so we got them ready. So, uh, thank you for your cooperation. Hang on to that, Mike, Doug, and Bill, why don't you come join us? We're about a cow apart. That's what I was told this morning, that the new safety measure is about a cow apart, unless you're in the family, then you can be about a calf apart. Who told me that? The meat counter. Oh, of all places. Thank you, Karen. That's awesome. Praises, prayer concerns. What do you bring today? Darwin, I know you have something. Thursday night, I got a call from Brian Hogwood. The surgery went good for Harlem. He had it on Thursday. And he said the doctor. Stamina to do the rehab that's going to be necessary, and that's their concern. 
All right, Tarlin needs, needs to go to rehab to get strength so he can start rehabbing. Let's pray that that happens. Bless his heart. He was uh, so happy that his church family is praying for him and his family. They're just so happy that that's happening. Great. Thanks, Tarlin. Someone else? I know Kent Dobinson made it home this week, I think on Thursday or Friday. Friday. So, yeah. he's, I don't, I'm not sure what his, what the hell, what he's got to do to he has to do some rehab or what. Mary, what is his, what do you call that condition? Do you remember? Thank you. 
Lord, that's for your touch upon Harlan's life. And as he's recovered from the surgery, that he would have the strength and the stamina to be able to do this rehab to help him get back on his feet and to uh, be able to get around and enjoy life again. Thank you that the surgery was able to be completed and successful to the extent that eliminated pain as far as I know and uh, thank you for that help. I also pray for this young mother, wife, Sarah, we just lift her and her family up to you. So this morning we pray for Kent. That, thank you that he was able to get through uh, the worst of it and all. And I pray that you'd continue to heal the lymphedema. I pray that um, he would be able to get back to being himself and that when Becky can come home that that would work itself out. I pray for Hannah and Elsa this morning that you would surround them with your grace Keep the outside influences in their body from their bodies that bring them down. You know that the continual nature of what they have is debilitating, and I pray that you would heal them. Pray for um, Mr. Patterson as well, the brain tumor that he has. I pray that you would guide the doctors to know how to deal with it. Pray that the medicine and the treatments that he has would continue to help, would, would start to help. Pray that you just also surround him with grace and peace for in the times that we do live in right now. Like Doug said, it's hard to see above all that and know that you are with us. Help us to remain focused on you. And thank you that we can be together and that we can worship you together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, man.
be honest, that's one of those songs that, uh, both of those songs just gripped my heart so deeply. And I was traveling in Ukraine, I was traveling with a professor, Christian professor of drama and art, and he was uh, examining and doing discovery work on that stanza in How Great Thou Art when through the woods he was trying to figure out where were they traveling there in Ukraine when the author wrote that song and he discovered where. And I had the great privilege of preaching one night in the mountains just where that's, that particular verse was written. And we saw a man with the church, uh, it was in late March, it was snowing, it was ice, we had a big pot belly stove pumping heat into the kind of long, narrow uh, worship building. And that night, uh, the Holy Spirit let a man, the congregation, praying for for 10 years. His wife was faithful. He wouldn't come. He came that night. And uh, the singing, there was special singing in, in uh, Romania because we were in the Romanian part of Ukraine. And I believe those singers touched his heart. And I preached about Jesus going, <coughs> going to the Pharisee's house, being anointed, and uh, that man came forward at the end of the service. And he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And it was so great because in, in the culture there, the men got in a long line right down the middle. And they came up. You know what they did? They hugged him and they kissed him on both cheeks. And then it was the next guy's turn. He hugged him and then he kissed him on both cheeks. Never seen that before. What do you think, guys? Should we try that here sometime? <laughs> ah, no, not so much. <laughs> well, that's not on the survey, is it? Yeah, not on the survey. Good. <laughs> oh, why? Anyway. That's the beauty of songs and hymns of praise. They draw us to the very presence of God. Our scripture today, and we're nearing the end of John 21. Pick it up at 17. We're really starting at 19, but 18, but uh, we just want to get the flavor for what's happening. Jesus is talking. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John. In other words, he was Simon Johnson. Okay, that's who Peter was. His real name was Simon Johnson. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? Of course, he's talking about John, who's writing here. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. 
Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Praise the Lord. Let's pray, Heavenly Father, following you, uh, a child can do it. Following you, people who are moved by the Holy Spirit are enabled by the supernatural power of God to obey and to glorify you by our actions, our attitudes thoughts or words, all that we are. Thank you that you spoke so directly to Peter so all the other disciples would hear and so that we would hear today. We understand this is important. Guide us into your thinking, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Part two, continue forward. Let's do a little reviewing here. Last week we talked about following includes understanding we're participating in his salvation. All other ties are broken. When we come to Christ, do we keep sinful practices alive? No. The Holy Spirit gives us the courage, gives us the grace, gives us the time clean ourselves up? Do we have to get cleaned up before we come to Christ? No. Did you have to, did you have to get all good and right? And No. So you came to Christ, you had some sin in your life, you asked for forgiveness, what did Jesus do with it? <coughs> Forgiven. It's a way. The penalty for that sin is gone forever. That's the beauty of following Jesus Christ. He sets us free. It's really hard for some people to grab onto this because they think that I can't give up whatever it is that's more important than Jesus. But it's reality and it's true. And even the parts of our lives that we will be changing can come up and just seem to be bigger than life. And yet that's where the power of the Holy Spirit, that's where the body of Christ, that's where a brother or a sister in Christ comes alongside and says, hey, you're not alone in this. Let's work on this together. How can I pray for you? I notice you might be struggling. You want to talk about it. You see, that's what being a brother or sister in Christ can mean. The Holy Spirit might lead you to ask, can we talk? Can we sure some, spend some time? Jesus is letting Peter know when, when you broke all other ties, all this fishing stuff, you walked away from it once and now here you are back at it again.
Praise God. Victor Bureau. I met his nephew a few years ago. It was really fun. I said, your great uncle preached and I was drawn to Christ. That was really sweet. When Jesus spoke to Peter, he was thinking about where Peter was going to be going. Where are you going in six, where are you going to be in six months? If you've got some goals, you know, it's, it's you got to put some markers out there. Two weeks, a month, six months, a year, two years, five years. Oh man, I used to hate trying to figure out what am I going to be doing in five years? Well, guess what? <laughs> that time is over. I don't have to wonder what I'm going to be doing in five years. I'm going to still be preaching here in Ratsa. <laughs> that was a joke. It was a little humor. You know, I, I, we were talking at the search team. I said, you know, when I came, it was so obvious. This was going to be a really sweet, short little stint. Maybe two months at the most. It was going to be so nice to be with these dear people. <laughs> Into our fifth year. What is this about anyway? <laughs> it's about following Jesus. That's what Jesus wanted Peter to figure out. It's all about total trust. If Jesus is following the parameters, the boundaries, the scenery can change incredibly. But as long as that's what Jesus wants, it's the best place to be. Someone often asks me, where's the safest place to live or to, to be working? And I say, right where Jesus wants you. It's been the inner city, safest place in the world. I remember taking my daughter. We moved her in to the heart of North Minneapolis. Sirens everywhere. We were sitting on the porch after we were done moving. And I said, this is quite a place, Jess. We'll be praying for you. She believed this is where Jesus wanted her to be living, serving, working, loving. You know, she said to me, I'll never forget it. She said, you know what, Dad? When I think about living here, my heart sings. Is that an indication that you're walking in the Spirit? I do believe so. That was so sweet. I'll never forget that night. And I'll bet you Peter never forgot this exchange he had with Jesus either. Second thing we learned last week. We participate in the very life of Jesus and the fate of Jesus. In other words, the tough things that he went through, we're going to be going through similar things that are tough. We pray for all our kids, and we pray for our son in prison. Marlene and I, as we talk, we say, but by the grace of God, we have peace. And Josh is doing the best he's done in his adult life, maybe ever. And he's so excited to let his light shine for Jesus. Man, yeah, there are tough times. God allows us to go through some tough times. Why? So he can be in control. I still remember praying, Lord, whatever it takes. I had no idea where that answer to prayer would lead us, except it led us to a higher commitment, a higher ground that we and our son travel together. It's a beautiful thing. That's why Jesus is reaching out to Peter. He's saying, 
I love you, and I know where you're going. I want you to have this kind of an attitude. I want you to have in your head and in your heart the attitude of a relationship of trust with the Savior. Now, Jesus knew that every one of us can be just as guilty as Peter here. Not, not, not one minute after Jesus pours out his heart and lets Peter know how much he loves him, Peter reverts to his old way of thinking. It's about me. It's about what I want to know and what I want to understand. What about John? If that's going to happen to me, if I'm going to bring glory to God by this death, when I'm old, what's going to happen to him? See, he wanted to know information can be power, and that power could, could, could uh, control and could influence a relationship. And Jesus knew that was the tendency. Peter, the first of the apostles, the first of the apostles to show up at that tomb and see Jesus had risen. The first one out of the boat when Jesus called him to the shore just a few verses before. And Jesus loves him back. He reinstates him. And here he's giving him a ministry plan for the future. Talk about a loving Savior. What does Peter do? He goes back to the old way of thinking. Information means power, means control. You read about the elite, that small inner core. It was Peter. Who's next? Peter, James, and then John. Peter, James, and John. Whenever you read about those three, Peter, James, and John. Peter, James. Peter had a position of authority. He was a leader. He said, let's go. I think it's 1337. He says, I'll go and die for you, Jesus. And now Jesus is telling him, yes, you will. And I'm going to tell you just how that's going to work out in his life. That was pretty much a boast. He was almost bragging. Jesus says, here's the way it's really going to happen. So what Peter is doing here, and what John is revealing, is that in understanding that his salvation, his total trust is in Jesus, and all that's going to happen needs to come from a heart relationship, not just a head that says yes, but the heart isn't moving with Jesus. That's what Peter was doing here. He was saying the right words, but his heart wasn't there. He was standing up and he was mad on the inside. His heart needed to be changed. Last week we read from 1 Peter 4, 8. It says, love each other deeply. Oh, he was on a, he was on a trajectory to grow into the love of Jesus Christ. And the first 10, 11 chapters of Acts... They're most, mostly about what Peter's doing and some of the other disciples. And then suddenly, we don't hear much about Peter anymore. Jesus knows. Peter's going to go some places and he's going to take his wife on missionary journeys with him. Yeah. Peter's going to preach to many Jews and many Gentiles and many will come into the kingdom. But you know what? He is not going to be leader among the apostles after a while. Jesus is getting him ready. Peter, you're not going to be the go-to guy all the time. Boy, that, that's, that's a hit to anybody's ego, isn't it? Look where I used to be and now, now look where I'm serving now. Unless your heart has been changed and you say, but that's what it means to follow Jesus. And so, here's what we see happening here. Peter is being a teacher for us to show us that this heart of love needs to 
be real and authentic, and it needs to be lived out day by day in relationship with the Lord and with those He has placed us around. You always have a heart of love towards the person that's on your right. Don't look at it right now, the person on your right. How about the person on your left? Don't look at to the left. You can look to the right if you want. Don't look to the left. <laughs> he wants us to realize that no matter what situation we're in, we can love the people he called us to live life with. Oh, I tell you what, sometimes we got to get the grinder out. We need to let the Word of God just change some of our thoughts, some of our attitudes. I love when I forget that I've forgiven somebody. Has that happened to you? You've forgotten that you forgave someone for something that they did against you. That is one of the most treasured experiences that I've been encountered. I don't forget everything, but there are some that I have forgotten, and maybe in a conversation or in a memory or in a thought or whatever, it'll, oh, totally forgot about that ugly experience. Thank you, Jesus. He's given us a little bit about his ability to forget about the pain we've inflicted on him through our sin. And that's what he wants to do. He wants us to have a heart of love that's as beautiful as these flowers here. They're just gorgeous. Uh, where did they come from again? From Uncle Clarence's.
Then the color of the carpet or chairs or pews or electronics, that's, that's a, that's a non-issue, that's a non-starter. Because we want Jesus to be glorified. We want Jesus to come to our neighbors. When people invite friends, we want them to sense God is in this place. And the reason I know that is because my neighbor is sitting here and he loves me or she loves me. I know their heart. Oh, what a joy. Thank you, Jesus. And so, this is the man. This is the going forward. Peter, a man whose heart has changed to be like Jesus and who wants to serve no matter what it looks like. Is it for the betterment of bringing people to Christ and helping people love others? There we go. So we can be so thankful that Peter revealed his heart. He had some growing to do. I've got some growing to do. Do you have some growing to do? I bet you do. Let's grow together. Let's grow together with a heart of love. Let's grow together serving Jesus no matter what. He'll get the glory. Let's pray. Jesus, oh, you, you were there. Your Holy Spirit encouraged John to capture these moments. And to remind us that life changes and your calling is always secure, no matter what the change is. We can always trust you. We can always experience new things if you're in them for your glory. Lord, give us courage. Give us humility. Oh, give us that heart of love. can only come from you.
going to close our service a little differently today. I need Samuel and Matthew to come up here, please. And I need Darwin to come up here. Here's what we're going to do. This, this theme is just overpowering, and so this is going to be a little different direction, but it's, it's the idea of surrender and service. It's a beautiful thing. Darwin, in just a few minutes, is going to lead everyone out of the church, and we're going to make just a big circle out in front of the church sign in the grass there. And uh, Samuel, you're going to be carrying the American flag, okay? So why don't you go get it right now and you can stand right here with it. And Matthew, would you get the Christian flag over there, please? And uh, the American flag will precede the Christian flag by just a little bit. Okay. And Darwin, when, see the girls are going to give us a salute. When you see the girls salute you, then you are going to lead your grandsons out. And then every one of us is going to follow and we're going to make a circle out there in front of the, so you guys plant yourself kind of in the middle of the lawn there in front of the church sign there, okay? But you need to get a salute before you, you go, okay? You got that? Well, those girls right over there are going to salute because they're going to play that famous suits uh, march since it's flag day. And so you watch them. You might want to step out here a little bit farther and just be able to... One or both of them, I don't know if they can play and salute at the same time, but they said they're going to give you a signal. Maybe you just want to stand closer. That's fine.